So I always knew, even from being really, really young, that I wanted to have my own business way before I even realised I wanted to be a hairdresser. I wanted to be a car salesman and a builder and all these things when I, when I was young. And my vision was to own a business and have people work with me. I just knew that I couldn't really be told what to do. What is going on people? Welcome back to the CEO Cast, the number one podcast for showcasing business and entrepreneurship. Now today you lot join me with someone who turned their barbering passion over 10 years ago into a business that is now recognized globally. I'm with none other than Sam Palmer, the owner of, of Menspire. How are you doing bro? Good, thank you bro. Alhamdulillah, how are you? Yeah, good bro. Good day. Very good day, yeah. Yeah. How about you? I'm, I'm very good man. I had a very good day, just uh, gym the whole lot and thought, you know what, we need to crack this out in the evening in the barber store, of course. Of course. Where, I must say it looks very professional, very neat, tidy. Everything about it looks proper clean, man. Good, alhamdulillah. I think we were going to shoot obviously earlier down in the office, but we thought oh, after your suggestion that maybe it deserves something a little bit more aesthetically pleasing. 100%. So I think 100%. it was worth waiting till after work. That's it. To capture this yeah. rather than the, the dingy office downstairs. So I'll, I'll ask you this, since we're talking about the store, what is it? that makes the store this store? I mean, obviously I know it's clean and aesthetically pleasing, but what is it that you want customers to experience when they're walking through the door for the first time? Before we get into it, make sure you subscribe and set the bell notification to all so you never miss a single episode. Um, an experience, I suppose. Um, little things like we don't we don't have music playing. We generally have like a nice fragrance burning. We generally are offering sort of uh, drinks on, on arrival. All the little bits and pieces just to make someone nice and comfortable. So you know, aesthetically, it's it's a it's a nice looking shop. It's not necessarily the best looking barber shop in the whole entire world, but that's not what we're about. We're about creating like a nice, friendly environment um, that people feel very comfortable. Uh, and you know, delivering fantastic haircuts and really caring about our service and and our end end product really. So that's yeah. that's interesting you say that. Just specifically about the music there as well, right? You said you don't play music. Like every barbershop I've been to, they always play some sort of music. Some barber stores even have a TV in front of you, it built into the mirror. That's on the music channels. So why is it that you've gone down? I'm assuming it's not going to be silent in here. So, so no, we generally speaking, we have um, something in the background playing, whether it's the, the TV, whether it's David Attenborough, whether it's a, a film, whether it's the sports, sports TV, um, whether it's rugby, football, whatever. Um, but we decided at the very beginning that we didn't want to have music playing. We didn't want to sort of create an atmosphere where there's so many ways to talk about it, but, you know, create like an atmosphere. If you put house music on or garage, garage music, you're going to get a certain type of vibe. If you put kind of like country music on or rock and roll music, you're going to get another kind of vibe rather than trying to, you know, specifically find and create a, a vibe of what Men's Bar is. We, we totally removed it, eradicated it um, and just made it kind of a bit more friendly to everyone. Everyone likes different things. Uh, and by removing that it kind of like, you know, removing the kind of the thudding music kind of it encourages conversation. Yeah. So we very much promote people having conversations in here. Uh, and it's just nice. It just makes it, you know, a very like a nice atmosphere where it's not too anything. It's very kind of neutral. You build like a community in here and then. Hundred percent, yeah. Yeah. And so the music thing—it's been—it's been. It's been um, originally, it was difficult to kind of implement, especially as we, as we've grown and obviously opened so many salons. Some people kind of want it, some people don't. Um, but in our in our in our core like salons, there's, there's no music being played. It's generally just like a like I said, the film or or footballs on or whatever. Yeah. And it just creates a very nice kind of like mutual atmosphere. Atmosphere where you know we we want to create an atmosphere where. This is what this is a kind of we go back to this where you know, a mother and son can sit and wait on the bench for a haircut and feel very very comfortable. Yeah. Um. You know, you know, ensuring that all the conversation that's taking place in here is 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 nice and clean and, and legit. We don't really kind of promote swearing and talking about certain things, politics, religion. We try and keep it all sort of down and, and quite mutual, just so everyone's comfortable, basically. Yeah, but we've got like, all, age group. Exactly that. But I always refer back to. I would like to, you know, my mum, for example, to come in here and, and feel comfortable by sitting on the bench. You know, there's no crude conversation. Or we try and avoid that. It is a barbershop after all, so the, the occasionally people slip and, and whatever. But we're all about, our ethos is, you know, a very, very comfortable, clean environment where people are just comfortable, you know. Yeah. So, I, yeah. I know the exact same feeling because whenever I do a podcast, I always think about, for example, the girls in my family, my sisters and my mum. When they watch it, I don't want them to feel uncomfortable in any way by yeah. having certain conversations or topics, which is why I kind of avoid those sort of things. So mm -hmm. understand it from your point of view, you want to keep some sort of conversations on the low or maybe when there's, you know, you might have youngsters around. Maybe those conversations can happen when there's no one around like that. Of course, you, you, use, wis you use wisdom. Um, yeah. For example, the lads, they'll, they'll be watching a film 
And my, my guys, for example, in this shop especially, like we're watching any kind of film, but if there's any kind of like swearing or it's a bit aggressive, or whatever, and a, and a kid walks in, yeah, it goes to the point someone will naturally go over to the remote and just put something, change it off, change it, and that's the kind of that's the kind of culture we have in here, just making sure everyone's everyone's comfortable. Yeah. Uh, and when there's someone young, and it, and if there's anything swearing or anything like that, it's someone automatically like quickly turns it off. It's very PG, yeah, very halal, and it and it kind of and it, and, it, and it works. It feels <laughs> nice. People are just comfortable with it, you know. So being with over twenty barbershops now, I don't know if I mentioned that in the beginning or not. So you've got over twenty locations now. Yeah, you being do, are you here most of the time? Uh, in this in this physical shop, um, no. I, when I do cut hair, it's it's here once or twice a week. Yeah. Um, this is this is basically like the first salon that we had. Yeah. Te- it was technically the second salon. Our first one was just around the corner. We we ended up leaving that after about a year. Yeah. Um, and we came to this one, but this is like my my hometown. This is like the the flagship, I suppose. So when I do cut hair, I'm I'm in in this one, but only like once or twice a week generally. Um, when you're not here, uh, all over the place really. Mix up like obviously lo- locations all over the place. I've yeah. uh, just come back from Manchester yesterday, where we have we have salons up north. Is it, have, I was probably there at the same time as you. So you were up in Manchester <laughs> yeah, the, yeah. the weekend as well. Yeah. Um, so I, was, I spent the weekend in Manchester. So we have shops in Manchester, in Nottingham, Leicester. So I kind of spread out my time. I live over in Radlett, which isn't isn't far from here. Um, so spend time in Radlett. You know, we, we've we've got, We've got a, got a n- store there as well, right? We've got a store there. We've got a number of, sort of a cluster of them quite locally. Yeah. So I mix it up between that and then a bit of traveling as well. We're, we're abroad as well. So see, my original question off the back of that is, yeah. I'm a massive fan of the franchise model, which I'm going to get to later on in this podcast. But my gripe, I suppose, with with franchises, is how do you maintain control and make sure that the same environment that you said in the beginning is spread across all those twenty plus locations. So that's 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 what I'm learning still currently. To be fair, bro. So we've 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 been a a brand now for well since 2012, but our first salon opened in in 2014. So we're coming up to our 10 year anniversary. Um, we have about 22 shops. I say that loosely because it's it's plus 20, but we've we've recently stripped back a couple. So. Um, we we used to well me personally I was all I was all about the numbers in the sense of that I you know I like to announce that we had 25 27 30 salons worldwide yeah. it sounded not ego based but it sounds obviously very impressive and and that was like my drive my driving force for for a number of, number of years really kind of like building it and and you know aggressive expansion and making it massive and, and really big which was incredible and it, you know it looked amazing but when we really studied some of our growth and some of the salons and some of the teams and some of the partners that we had they weren't all in line with exactly what we kind of wanted the men's bar to be. Mm-hmm. So now when we talk about how many salons we've got, not that it, it's a small amount, but it feels like a more, you know, a smaller amount than what we had. Um, but it's the, the quality is there now. Um, so every, every shop we have is, 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 you know, really a men's buyer. So for me, it's not really about focusing on, on, on numbers in terms of just open salons everywhere. It's about finding the good quality partners and, and growing these partners um, and having, you know, as many salons as these guys can kind of handle, but rather than just everyone being able to kind of access it. Not that we've ever really been like that, but we, as, as we grew, we kind of, you know, you know, some of them, we just wanted to have cool locations. We wanted to be in Dubai, we wanted to be in the Four Seasons Hotel, all this kind of stuff. So we kind of did it. Uh, I actually remember trying to organise a, ho- a haircut yeah, view in Dubai this, yeah. a long time ago. But, um, <laughs> I think that, this was maybe two years ago. Two years ago, like, yeah. A year ago or so something. that's a good example. So we, we had a we had a salon in Dubai. This was in Versace Hotel? Versace Hotel, yeah. but... I mean, I tried to get you in there that one time. I'm not, I'm not even sure. I never I found out what happened. happened. <laughs> but what I will say, it wasn't the right for us. it wasn't the right situation for us. It so was, it's not there anymore. Not there. No, not for a while. In COVID times, we kind of decided to kind of get rid okay. of it. So it sounds it sounded amazing. Well, for me anyway, it sounded amazing saying that we had you know men's bar Dubai. But when we really studied the quality of 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 the shop, the partners we had, and everything, it wasn't quite to what we wanted. So we kind of we kind of stripped it away. So <clears throat> it's a good example how it kind of sounds better than it is. So to answer your question, how do we kind of maintain the standards? It's about really vetting our, our partners that we're working with and I suppose keeping an eye on everything. Um, and I'm really not scared to or, or afraid to kind of pull them back if they're not working and they're not kind of true to brand and don't feel right. We're in a position now where we know what we want and if, if, you, if it's not sort of adding up. You can cut it off. Cut it off basically, yeah. So, um, so now I'm in a good position, lots of salons, but like really, really good quality, high standards salons that I'm very, very proud of that, are, you know, true, true men spire. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and as we grow now, we have, we have a number of people in, at, the, at the minute that we, we're kind of opening shops with and stuff, which is great. But for me, it's more about, I'm focusing on the guys that we currently have in the brand that want to open more and more shops rather than outsiders. Let's, you know, let's say a lot of interest, um, a lot of interest from investors and things like that. But 
people who come along and just see it as like a, a golden ticket to make a quick bit of money, yeah, money they're yeah. very wrong it's, it's something that you have to invest a lot of time and your life into basically so, so how do you actually vet like who can be a franchise partner let's just say let's put us two in perspective right now sam yeah so sam i want to open men's buyer in east london what's so the first steps that you you would come to me and say that i want to open men's buyer in east london i would um <clears throat> i would suggest that we went for some lunch we spent some time together yep. and that whole time I'm, I'm, I'm asking you questions and just kind of figuring, figuring you out a little bit, like where you're coming from, uh, what's your intentions, why, why, do you want to, why do you want to get involved? And I suppose I'll just like, I'm, I'm, I would say I'm quite a good judge of character. I'll probably vet you out in the sense of spend some time socially with you, probably not even talk about numbers or business, just yeah. some see time what with you like yourself, see what you like. Um, and then agree to do that again and just kind of take my time on, on the on the person for example that's that's you know that's the example of you coming to me we we get people who email us quite often they want to open up somewhere in portugal or, or we had someone in cyprus the other day uh and it, we do like little testing things so I'll, I'll get my 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 guy will generally send like a questionnaire to them and they'll, they'll come give us back a lot of answers why do you want to do it how long have you been interested in the brand you know all these kind of things and then it'll be very much like the case of okay cool come out and and, and see us mm -hmm. or if you want to fly us out to come and see you and, 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 and you know all that kind of stuff we kind of go down that, that avenue That's but we rude. make sure like I hate to say it but you judge someone's Instagram you judge someone's email you judge someone's text message you judge someone's phone call you judge someone based on on getting to know someone you know as much as you can uh, and the main thing is there's, there's no rush for us it's all about like we're always about looking for the right characters and I feel like um, you can kind of like figure someone out after a couple of times of interaction to what they're all about and ask the right questions you hear the right kind of thing so yeah. that's that that would be the example of how I'd vet you out I'd, I'd just take some time with you and ask you some questions and kind of figure out why is it that you want to get involved yeah and you can kind of suss out the true intentions out. exactly yeah. that um, and then a, a good a good way is you know the people who email from from abroad let's see how serious you are book us some flights and a hotel and, 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 and let's come and see what you're talking about. Yeah. And that will separate the, the people who are serious and who aren't so who serious. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, fair enough. This episode is sponsored by Fireway Pizza, the fastest growing pizza company in the UK. With over 100 locations, you definitely have a store near you. The founder of Fireway was on the show not too long ago and you can get a slice of the action by using the discount code CEOcast at fireway.co.uk. Once again, use the discount code CEOcast at fireway.co.uk. Yeah. But you know, for like franchise owners, yeah, people who take on a franchise, my thought training is that, you know, sometimes they might have several franchises, whether it's yeah, like, for example, they might already have a fireway pizza, they might already have a, um, a chai wall or something like that. And then they might have a men's buyer. Having multiple different businesses, different franchises, does that put you off or, cause you, at the end of the day, you've got to look at it as in like time invested into men's buyer, right? So is it something that puts you off or does it put you on because they're like, okay, you've got experience in running different businesses? It's a good question. I think if someone just showed up and they had, a portfolio of different franchises and, and they, if they were doing well and they could show me that they were doing well and there was some sort of time that they sort of put into it, I'll definitely be in, interested in, in, in reviewing that and looking at that. But what I would say to anyone, just like anything, if you want to get into any kind of industry, any kind of job, anything really, you have to give it like so much time, yeah. especially at the very, very beginning. So I have a lot of people, alhamdulillah, a lot of people come up and, and, and ask if they can invest into Men's Bar or if they can open a shop here or do that. And I know they're not really they're not really in it full time. They just, they see it as like an investment opportunity. But for me, it's all about having the people who basically show up and say, look, I'm willing to, to spend my life building this. And, you know, I know it takes some time. I know it takes a lot of sacrifice, you know, emotionally, physically, you go through everything building a successful business. So yeah. for me, it's all about the, the people who've got time is the most attractive thing. Someone like, for example, we had a, we had a great meeting up in Manchester. Someone uh, wants to open multiple shops um, and it's, it's all amazing until you find out but they want us to control it, look after it and all the rest of it. So I'm sitting there thinking, this is obviously an, an amazing thought, amazing concept, an amazing you know, potential deal. But then I was sitting there the whole time thinking, really the value for me is someone in front of me who is the right kind of person who wants to take on a shop and they want to do that, the hard work that you know, it takes to kind of build it and stuff. So it was interesting thought process. I'm thinking, I don't really want someone who's got money. I just want someone that I can utilize and someone that I can grow with and, and, and work with. Yeah, for sure. So the true value is just finding the, the right people. Um, you know, we live and learn. I, I've had partners that I, I'm not no longer doing business with. Um, and that's all part of like the growth of-, of, of, of It's all part of the game, I suppose. It's all part of it. And, and I don't look at it, it's a cliche thing to say, but I don't look at it like a loss. I, I really, really don't. I look at it as we have to figure out how to, to, to get to where we want to get to. Uh, and there'll be some losses along the way. There'll be some people that come and go along the way. Um, so there's been lots of like great people that we've worked with that we don't longer work with, but um, 
it definitely uh, it doesn't doesn't put me off kind of like doing business with with new people. It's all I think learning it's all curve. Part of, yeah, and I think it's a risk. I mean, you you don't always it doesn't always pay off, but you you risk you don't you can't get to know get to know someone sort of you know through and through until you really do business with them and you spend some time with them. So sometimes along the way there will be people who maybe haven't got the best intentions and and it doesn't work out, but. No problem. It doesn't put me off. It just, it, you know, it just... It makes you learn. I mean, I've done business 100%. with people, collaborations with people, and it doesn't necessarily work out to the best favour in the long run. Mm-hmm. But you learn from it at the end of the day. You know where to step forward at the next time. You know where to make your corrections or what to look out for in the future. So... Sure. Very valuable. It's, it's all part of the game. 100%. 10 years in the business now. Mm-hmm. What does it mean to you to be a CEO? Um... So I'm thrilled, bro. Alhamdulillah. I'm really, 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 really grateful for my position that I'm, that I'm in. Uh, so it's been 10 years of Menspire, but... I've been in in the industry, in the hair industry for about 18 years now. So I left school sort of early. I left school when I was 15, 16 and started working in a hair salon. May may I ask why you left school? I wasn't academic at all. Very kind of anti-school to be fair. Yeah. Um, Flop school and like, you know, a bit of the the class clown and and, and was asked to leave a little little bit earlier than than you should have done just because I was just a nuisance for everyone basically. (laughs) Flopped all my exams, distracted everyone. I was that guy. But I always knew that I was there was something out there for me that I was going to get my hands around and, 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 and smash to be honest. I was very confident. I wasn't like a waster. I just knew school and the academic thing wasn't for me. Yeah. So fortunately, my mum got me a job in a, in a hair salon when I was still at school, just Thursday evenings, just to give me a little, a little taste. Something you wanted to do or? Something I wanted to do, not in a hair salon as such. I, I love the thought. I was, I was into my fashion and hair and stuff. So my mum had a friend and my mum's great. She, they, my fr- her friend didn't even have a, a job role available, but my mum basically paid m- my wages through her. Oh, is it okay? J- just to like give me an opportunity to s- see something. Yeah. And um, and I loved it. Although it was it was hard work. I remember starting at like four or five on a Thursday night and working through till nine or something, uh, for a very busy sort of December, November, December. Hard work, making coffees, cleaning, cleaning the floor. Like not great work. But I saw something in that opportunity. I saw something in, in, in that kind of window of, of opportunity that was working with like a new team of people, not being in the school environment, but being with adults basically that were all on their own, kind of their own hustle. Yeah. And I got a lot out of being in that environment. I actually was shown a lot more respect in that environment than I ever was at school or anything like that. So I remember I quite liked it and thought, wow, although all I'm doing is clearing up rubbish, making coffees and not doing, I wasn't even washing hair, I wasn't even that advanced really kind of like low end stuff, but I saw something within it that I really liked. So I was very grateful to my mum t- to organize that. And then I left school and ended up, I worked in this hair salon for about a year or so. Um, and it wasn't necessarily the type of hair, sal- hair salon that I wanted to be in, but it gave me a kind of a, a taster um, of being in you know, the hair industry as such and uh, working with, with adults and, and you know, learning basically. So very, very, very grateful for that, that starting point. And then from there, I took a bit of time off. Then I started working in a, in a, in a really cool brand that um, they had an academy up in Knightsbridge and they, had, they were in Mayfair, Covent Garden, all these kind of places. So I worked with this brand and, and I was them, with them for about four or five years. Uh, and I'm very, very grateful to, to be in that brand, in that position, because that really showed me a very, very high level of standards. Mm-hmm. I was working in Knightsbridge, I was working in Mayfair, so I was working with some you know, very high-end clients that really, really taught me how to talk to people, how to communicate with people, especially high-end people. Um, so very, very grateful for, for that whole kind of episode. Then I, then I left there and basically started working for myself for a couple of years at, at my house down the road. So although it's been 10 years of men's bar, I feel As like, in, like hairdressing from home. Yeah, hairdressing from home. My parents, my parents gave me their front room, turned it into a, a barber shop. Yeah. Um, so I left like the hair salon, like doing ladies hair and stuff, started working at home and pretty much just did men's hair. Um, so yeah, I've been doing hair for, for, for a long period of time. I always knew I wanted to have my own business, my own shop. So I worked at my parents' house for a short period of time. That, that ended up, it should have been about a year tops, ended up being about two and a half years, excuse me. And along that time, um, myself and, and Josh LaMonica, my business partner, we were, we were talking a lot more and, and, and sort of planning about doing something. So yeah, two and a half years later, we then uh, came together and opened our first shop in 2014, which is just around the corner now. Um, and it's been, it's been an amazing 10 years. I feel like we had a big like head start because when we first opened the shop, we were both kind of, locally very busy so we were both kind of fully booked we both had loads of clients everyone that we brought in was was kind of busy so we started with a bit of a bang to be honest um like i said to you earlier we opened the first shop in 2014 but we actually opened the business in 2012 where we both kind of we both invested into um a hair care line um we both we opened twitter instagram and we basically started building the brand so for a couple, couple of years before the actual shop opened the brand was kind of quite big we had a couple of thousand followers on instagram at the time that was that was quite impressive because there was no physical shop 
So we, we, we were building this brand and the name Men's Spy was really getting out there for years before the shop even opened. So when the shop did finally open, it, w- it was like a bang. Um, I'm going to pause you there and just throw you back to one key thing, cool. quite a big thing, which I th- think in my opinion, but you might not have recognised it. Go on. But in that whole process, yeah, of, of you, you know, working in the salon, working uh, from your mum and dad's house, mm-hmm. there's one big key in that thing. And that is the fact that you could either had gone back to another salon and you could have gone down the route of being a hairdresser for the rest of your life. And no disrespect to people who are doing that now, mm. but you could have gone down that route. Yeah. Or, you know, you could have started your own salon, essentially, which is what you have done. Yeah. So what is it that made you want to take that risk inside you? So I always knew, even from being really, really young, that I wanted to have my own business. Like way before I even realised I wanted to be a hairdresser, I wanted to be a car salesman and a builder and all these things when I, when I was young. And my vision was to own a business and have people work with me. And I was quite like convinced that was the way it would go. Um, but what was it attracted to you? Like the lifestyle that come with it? Or? Not even not even with a headspace or even understood any anything like that. I just knew that I couldn't really be told what to do. Okay. And I, and I didn't like being told what to do. Yeah. So I always just envisioned like whatever I did, it would be off my own back and not in a bossy kind of way that I would have people that work with me. And it was just like a weird thing fixed in my head. So little things like when I worked in this, you know, quite re- re- um, credible hair salon, my manager who, you know, she worked for the company. She didn't own the company or anything. And I remember asking her because she was so amazing and so capable of doing like amazing amazing things she was the backbone of the company and I think I offended her a couple of times because I was always asking her why don't you do your own thing why don't you have your own team I don't understand why don't you have your own salon why don't you do this why don't you? and I was asked these questions which probably at the time were you know slightly cheeky but for me all I could see is like if you're ca- if you're so capable of doing it why would you work for someone else yeah and she always used to try and she almost shut me up saying you don't want the stress trust me Sam you don't want the stress of having your own team imagine all these people complaining you don't want the stress of bills and rent and all this kind of stuff I remember kind of battering it away and thinking I, mean, I never understood why she worked for someone else so um, so going back to when I left the salon and stuff there was a job lined up and I'm very very grateful that it, it didn't work out someone someone actually approached me the day I left they, they found out about it because I was quite busy and people, you know, quite a valuable asset for, for a business to, to that to, team yeah. yeah so someone approached me and asked me for a job um, and potentially you know he wanted to partner up and do some stuff so I had a meeting with him and it was all really good and then I remember I went on a holiday for a week or two and then I remember touching base with him again and he just didn't seem that keen at the time like maybe with ego got affected a little bit. I was thinking, right, if you're, you don't want me to come and work with you or for you or whatever, knowing that I had all the clients and everything else, I was thinking, that's fine, I'll, I'll, I'll do my own thing. So I'm very grateful that opportunity didn't come to light because you know, quite potentially I would have gone down the road of, of working for someone and, and being stuck in that kind of way. Um, but I did kind of always knew that I wanted my own business, my own salon. I even went to the extent of kind of like writing down exactly how I wanted the salon to look. Um, so I did kind of, it was always just embedded in me that I wanted to have my own, my own business. And how you wrote it down then is this how it looks like? Bro, I literally wrote down uh, Britwork, exposed Britwork. Is it okay? And you can see so every to, single the, detail. To, the left, to the left of you, it's, yeah, every single detail. A few things missing, but I remember visualizing it and it's not a million miles off this, which is like really the first true men's spire. So the brick, the brickwork is, is, is iconic for me because I remember I wrote that down when I was 16 years old, maybe having like a, having a whole kind of brickwork on display. So it's kind of crazy there's brickwork there. Uh, if I had to imagine, that's that's got to be part of like the Men's Fire franchise model. There is, there is brickwork. We've evolved a little bit since that, but um, but I love it. And I think it's maybe a little bit dated now, but I love it because I remember writing it on a list, on a, on a piece of paper in a book when yeah, I was just like so manifestation. young. Literally that, yeah, literally that. Um, so I kind of, yeah, like to answer your question, I kind of always knew that I wanted my own thing. Uh, I'm very, very grateful that I found someone along the way that had exactly the same kind of vision as me because... Um, definitely couldn't do this alone. It's very much like a it's a it's a team thing, and, and uh, you know, especially my, my business partner Josh. When we first you know started things up, it's it's, it's been a collaboration. Um, but yeah, I mean, I I knew that I never wanted to kind of be told what to do for, for the rest of my life, and you know, to to the point of having to wear a uniform and what time I had to leave and having to ask for holiday, all that kind of stuff. I, I knew I was never about that. That I was knew, my biggest thing. Yeah, I had to have my own. I want. I, mean, I I felt like a prisoner working in these hair salons when you had to request to have like a week off or a weekend off, you had to write a, like a, write a message and almost like suck up to the, to the yeah. manager or whatever. Yeah, I remember yeah, that yeah. and feeling like a prisoner and, and I'm, I'm, I'm grateful for it, my experiences, but I remember I never want to feel like that again. And I don't want my staff and I don't want my staff now to feel like it. And I don't have that kind of same structure. Yeah. I learned a lot from that, but feeling like a prisoner and just showing up, you have to show up early, you leave late, you get paid crap. It's very limiting. 
um, you know, you don't have your own kind of your own way of doing things. I remember I had to, for example, I had to wear all white. So when the summertime came in this brand that I work for, you had to wear all white. So like a white t-shirt or white shirt, white trousers, like uniform, uniform or white. And I really struggled with it. I mean, I don't, I don't think wearing all white as, as, as someone my sort of height and size looks that great anyway. Mm. But I remember like having some like real like almost breakdowns and, and almost leaving a few times because I had to wear all white to work. And then I had to travel up to London and work in London and I was wearing all white. And it might sound like normal. Some people like to wear all white. Mashallah, it's a sooner, that's great. But yeah. when you're <laughs> in a hair salon and you're wearing white shoes, white trousers, white shirt. You're bound to get dirty, you know. But it's just exactly dirty. You look like you're playing cricket. It's just not a great look. So I remember thinking, I never want to be like, told or even to even tell people like you have to do this have to do that because I just don't think it, it didn't make me feel very nice so I knew I had to do my own thing to answer your question basically yeah that's like me as well to be fair I used to hate small things like I, I'm, I'm a person that will never suck up to anyone mm -hmm. doesn't matter who you are what you do or anything like that right and sometimes with managers in places that I'd work they'd kind of expect you to suck up to them for whatever reason and then even when it comes to asking for annual leave once again they expect you to butter them up and do all the smoothness and all that sort of stuff yeah. and then ask for 10 days off just for them to say no of course so from that from my first job I always knew that no nah, I'm not doing this for the rest of my life I'm mm -hmm. not sucking up to anyone I'm not gonna have to ask for permission to do things the way I want to do it I'm gonna try and do my own thing so that's exactly where we are same as me right yeah. now yeah so you mentioned this is the second store, right? Yes. So the first store, what was, what's so happening? The first store is literally two minute walk around the corner. Um, that's the, the first ever uh, men's bar we opened on Stanhope Road. Um, so we, we were working there. We were, it was the, within the first sort of four to five months of being there. We kind of, myself and Josh went out back as we had a busy Saturday and we literally looked at each other and said, this shop's too small for us. We, we need to do bigger. So we had four chairs at the time, four barbers fully booked. And it was a very, very small shop. So we um we always used to walk past this place and it was a recruitment agency at the time. How soon is this into that so shop? Within the first year, so the eight maybe eight months. We eight months or so. We kind of discovered this. This was available, uh, and Josh kind of had to persuade me a little bit because we obviously we, we spent a reasonable amount of money on this shop. Yeah. Um, and it you know it cost you know a reasonable amount, amount of money to get it going. So when we were walking past this shop and he was saying let's move to this shop, I was thinking that's crazy. We've just spent X. It's going to cost us another X amount. Are you sure that's the right thing? And we went back and forth, back and forth, um, and we decided it was the right thing. So we we left that shop, opened this shop. We we opened up with with eight chairs. We had chairs downstairs, and we had the five chairs upstairs, and all the all the chairs were kind of taken and, and fully booked. So this is a really important shop um, to me. I call it like the launch pad. We've had a lot of people who have worked here who now have their own men's spa like franchises or, or partnerships with us. So quite a lot of people have kind of worked here with us. Um, and then they've gone off to kind of open their own shop. So as soon as we, we changed to this bigger shop, it's almost like we were taken a bit more seriously. It was easier to recruit. We obviously had eight, eight chairs that we could, we could give people rather than the measly four. Um, so it was like a, a big investment again. It was in within the first year or two of, of, of opening a shop. We then opened a second shop. So loads of people were naturally telling us, that's ridiculous, why are you doing that? You just open a shop, just, just stay small and just chill stay, out. Yeah, yeah, chill out. Um, but it was the right thing to do and it and it really, really did pay off. And uh, we actually ended up changing the old shop into a, uh, a coffee shop, into oh, a shop okay. 59, yeah. um, which we, we, we ran for a couple of years and then and kind of like a couple of years ago, we sold it. Um, but we, yeah, that was that was a really cool like, learning experience. We basically had an empty shop and we used it for our, our stock and storage basically. And then we thought, you know what, let's do something. Let's, let's do something nice and new. So we did like a juice bar, which then turned into a juice and coffee, which then turned into juice, coffee and food. And now, alhamdulillah, there's, there's a few of them, there's a kind of franchise, and there's a few of them popping okay? around, yeah. So, so the uh, person who's taken over is actually taking it to really well, really, really well, yeah. Always what I kind of wanted to do with it, but didn't have the time yeah, for I it. Yeah, I suppose when you're so busy with this. That's it. So I remember I remember going down the road of opening the, the, the juice bar and um, it, it taking a lot of my time up, basically. And then at the same time, I'm opening more men's bars, but we're starting to kind of open more shops. And it was the, the time the, the, and the energy was getting consumed too much with the... 59 basically so we we got rid of it what uh, did that make you learn what type of person you are because you also like you know you get serial entrepreneurs right who who have a men's buyer then they'll have another business another business xxx you know mm. they might have like 10 businesses yeah or you can get that one entrepreneur who's just focused so focused on that one business but then takes it to the next level where you know if we're, if we're talking about revenue wise it will outweigh all these 10 businesses put together so so my thought process was as a like a young entrepreneur that let's have multiple things um, because multiple streams will make sense. Um, and that's what I was doing. I was doing a couple of different things at once. And it did really make me realize that I was putting too much time into 
to too many different things where my main thing, my baby, which is Menspire, was not getting neglected as such, but I knew if I put that same time into this, it would be doing it would be doing more for me. So um, I, I kind of registered quite early that actually for me to do this is going to take a lot of time to get it to where I want to be. Meanwhile, my main thing around the corner is getting neglected a little bit. So from I learned a lot from that whole situation. Really, really grateful that I had the, the, the process and understanding of how to open a coffee shop. And I'm glad I've got that skill set because I will probably do it again at some point because it was it was great. Um, but I did learn a lesson that actually I need my, my focus and time needs to be in Menspire. And I'm glad I got rid of those bits and pieces that I was doing to be able to focus on this because that's when it really kind of like got exciting and we started growing more and more and more. Elevated, yeah. And I'm still in that process now of like, I've got other things going on, but anything that takes up too much of my time I'm quite cautious of even even recently like taking on new things and actually realizing the amount of work that's going to go into need to go into this for it to be where it needs to get to is is a lot meanwhile I've, I'm gonna I can't really step away from this because this is still just a real you know 10 years in but still a baby just we're just getting to where we want it to, to go now so yeah. um, for me and my experience is it's better to put everything in, into one thing um, that's just for me I'm sure people can do multiple things and, and it work um, but for me, it's like, I want to make sure Menspire is exactly where I want it to be before I kind of get involved with too much other stuff, especially if these other things require a lot of time, uh, time and, and energy and me actually being hands on, you know, because being hands off, investing in bits and pieces when you don't have to do anything. I'm all for that. But when you've got to be hands on, uh, you've got to be careful because you understand that if you if you if you take your eyes off the, off the prize, the main thing. You know, you're just you're just weaken it basically. So my main thing is Menspire. Uh, I have other few, a few other things sort of going on, but my main thing is Menspire. Until the job is done here, which we're, we're way off, um, I'll, I'll I'll be fully focused on on building Menspire. I suppose. I think as an entrepreneur, you'll never be done. But I will, I will get to the like the you know the vision and the goal for you with Menspire shortly. Mm -hmm. But just touching on from this store to now opening your third store, what area was that? And was that with a partner or was that you and Josh as well? So that was. Um, so we, our first shop was around the corner, then, we then moved to here, and our second shop from here was in Dublin, Ireland. Oh, okay, <laughs> completely far away. Yeah, yeah. so we literally, <laughs> that was our, our second shop. So we were looking locally, we were looking down in Harpenden, which is a town down the road. We were looking locally, me and Josh were looking at our second shop. Um, and then at the same time, we had someone called Glenn McGoldrick, who, an Irish fellow from Dublin, who came over. We actually interviewed him in the, in the first shop, and he basically said to us in that shop, he said, I want to take a men's bar back to Dublin. And I thought, wow, it's quite a premature thing to say, considering we've only, we haven't even started this thing yet. You can't even see what the brand's all about. We've only got one small little kind of humble shop. And ju just to interrupt you there, mm. sorry, the partnership and like franchise model, was that in your head at that point? Uh, yes, it was. We did a partnership, so that was kind of like our earlier model, which yeah. is partnership. So we have, we still do them, but less franchise is kind of the, the way we stick to now. It's a lot easier. Yeah. But it was a, a true, fra um, a true partnership. So this guy Glenn telling us that he wants to open a shop back in Dublin. I was like, cool. I, I believe it when I see it. He then worked for us for a couple of years, um, and he was amazing. To be fair, he then went and we went over and did a tour in America. That he went with Josh and did a lot of education with Josh. So he was really like doing a lot of stuff with us. Then he went back to Dublin. Then he opened a shop. So and we we did that together. So we invested in that shop with him. So it was like a partnership. So it's our shop, let's yeah. say, um, and all of the ones in in, in Dublin, uh, other than one, are, are all our shops, uh, which is a nice thing to say. Um, and that was yeah, that was only a couple of years into the brand. We had our second shop, which was in Dublin. Um, so that was that was that was literally our, our second shop. So it was always part of the plan then. Always part of the plan, bro. Um, we always wanted to do lots of shops. We were always looking for our. We were looking for people. That's the main thing. We're looking for people, strong people that want to get involved with the brand and uh, you know align themselves with, with us. So even the first few months of of the first shop, we were talking to someone in Dubai then who wanted to do a franchise then Dubai and Abu Dhabi. And again, I was thinking like the brand was kind of strong. It was on social media and Twitter and it was we were doing like really cool stuff, but yeah. it wasn't really anything, to be honest. It was very, very early on. But but the reason I mention it is that we were that was where our mindset was. We were looking to try and grow um, and, and grow quite big. So it didn't work out with, with, with that guy. But that was the kind of mindset we were looking to kind of do international grow go big and, and, and all that kind of stuff from yeah, early. Yeah, I'm, I'm uh, like I said in the beginning, I'm a massive, massive fan of the whole franchise model from the back end and the front end. You know, you got, you know, someone like myself who would come into, rather than open up a brand new hairdressers, I can come into a brand that's already established, mm -hmm. that already has the name, maintain that. And, you know, once you when, once people see Menspire and they recognise it already, mm -hmm. your doors already can be coming flooding in rather than having to build the whole thing. Same thing on the back end as the owner like yourself, you know, 
growing on such a level where you're franchising them, you get to have stores all over. Obviously, it probably works in terms of royalties and stuff like that. It works business-wise. It's perfect, right? Yes. So where does that actually take you in terms of, you know, being over 20 plus stores right now? Where do you actually envision it to go to? Um, I do feel like we are literally at the very, very start. It's easy to say that, but like we, we do, especially in terms of franchising, we've just kind of like, we're just figuring that out now still. And we, we've kind of, we figured it out. That's the best way of, of, of growing. We were doing lots of partnerships and, 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 you know, from our experiences, we've realized that the franchise model is, is perfect for us. Yeah, I mean, I've, I've been fortunate to sit with the owners of uh, Fireware Pizza yes. and uh, Jai Wala. Yes, and doing, I'm, both doing very well. Yeah, every single time I sit in front of them, I'm just like, yeah, you man are crazy. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> but he's doing some big numbers. Yeah, uh, I was very inspired by that podcast, actually. Yeah, uh, the, yeah maybe, maybe after just think, well, I need to get a lot more shops. <laughs> um, and uh, so, yeah, bro, like, I feel like we've just started. Let's just say, for example, we've got 20, 24 shops, whatever it is. I think it needs to be like times 10 more. Like it, it, it could be hundreds and hundreds of shops. Like I'm not, I haven't got a particular number in mind, but I know where we are now is, is very, very small from where we, we want to take it. Um, last year, my plan was this year just to was continue smashing out and open like an extra 10, 20 sh- stores. It hasn't quite worked out that way. It's worked out a little bit more like I was, like, like I was explaining a bit more, kind of slow and steady, just kind of like everything we've got now, perfecting it, making it strong, working a lot more internally rather than bringing too many exterior people in. So this year has been a more about kind of controlling and, and, and stabilizing everything. But uh, really and truly, I, I want to grow all over the world. I feel like there's a market for us in everywhere, to be yeah, honest. You sure, can yeah. name, everyone name needs it. a haircut. Everyone needs a haircut. Everyone needs a good haircut. Everyone needs a nice environment. It's not like we're not doing anything crazy different from other people. We just provide a really good haircut, really good service with a really good barber in a really nice environment. Like it's not rocket science. It's just yeah. nicely done. And the so, thing is, once you build that, sorry to interrupt, you're yeah. gone. I was going to say, I think you can roll that anywhere. I think that there's a demand for this environment and this kind of barber shop, hair salon everywhere. So there's, you know, there's no limits really. Yeah, and I think, like I was going to say, I think once you build that community in your store, people are going to stick. Yeah. You know, if I come to a men's buyer, is, is there one in East London? There's not yet, no. Bring one there. Be nice, yeah. <laughs> but once you bring the community there mm-hmm. and then you get an environment going, I'm. it almost like becomes like a networking place. Yeah, 100%. Because different people come in for different haircuts. You want to find out what they do. So yeah. The conversation starts going. You meet people there and then you end up staying loyal to the shop. Absolutely. Absolutely. That's the, that's the way it is. Yeah. What else do you do apart from, like you said, you double into a few different things here and there. So, um, so my main thing is 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 Menspire. So my main role with Menspire is 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 the the salons and, and the growth of the salons. We have other parts of the business. We have a we have a very large education platform. We have three academies worldwide. So that's more what kind of Josh kind of focuses on. So so when you say academy, what is it exactly? So we have like an education academy. So we have one up in the centre of town, which I, I was going to do the filming at, but they were again they were busy till a bit later. So we have students. So at the minute we have um like a beginners beginners uh, group. Yeah. So teaching brand new barbers but we have professional groups um basically teaching barbers and hairdressers how to cut hair to a high standard so we've got one in st albans we've got one in dublin ireland and we've got one in portland usa um yeah, portland usa okay yeah so we've got a salon there as well um and, uh, and some of our uk uh, educators are actually out there at the minute currently doing some doing some work out there so um so that's what Josh kind of focuses on. And then I kind of focus on the salons and, 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 and the growth of the salons and the growth of the, the managers and everything else. What and is it exactly you teach the barbers though? How are to they, cut hair. Well, are they like people like me who have no idea how to cut so hair or? We do beginners beginners groups. So we, we have that as an option, but um, so we do have like a, a continuous, like a full-time beginners group going on in, in both in, in St. Albans and in, in Dublin. And then we have professional groups. So people who are, good at cutting hair but they want to learn and, and, and improve their skills set, basically so we've got a very humdullah we've got a really good reputation in the industry um and and, and josh de monica is, is is one of the best the best educators the best barbers is very well known worldwide so he kind of heads up that part of the business which is which is a very large part of the business um so that's what he kind of focuses on um and then i focus on the salons and we also have the, the product line men's by product line which which does really well uh, and that's a new focus for us. We're, we're about to sort of, sort of go down that avenue a little bit more at the minute. So that's really exciting. Um, and uh, I suppose recently, something that I've been focusing on myself is kind of like online coaching, mentoring stuff, uh, which I actually started, I started in lockdown. For barbering or for? So I originally started just for barbering and, and hairdressing. Um, and now I've opened it actually to, I've got a whole mix of people from loads of different industries, which I wasn't, didn't really set out to do. I kind of, I've, I started doing it in lockdown, obviously everything was shut and locked down. I had all my shops were, 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 were stuck and, and, and locked and closed. 
So, um, and I also always had like a high demand of people asking me questions about this, that, and the other about how to open up new shops and recruitment and all these kind of stuff. So I was like, cool. Why don't I? Why don't I make this a service and and, and charge for for phone calls basically? So something I started doing in lockdown, which went really well, which I really really enjoyed. So I was, I was coming here and doing sort of like maybe twelve or thirteen phone calls in a day, really kind of like maximizing on my on my downtime, and that's something now I've kind of like grown and uh, and building currently, which I really really enjoy. And it was originally for barbers and hairdressers, and now it's for anyone really. And again, I vet them a little bit. I don't want to just take on anyone because I don't feel like I can help everyone. Yeah, but um, depends how serious they are. How they're serious they are, and and I ask them the question: How do you think I can help you? Because I don't think um, I feel like I'm someone that's just got a good experience over the last ten years in business. I don't think I didn't go to a business school or, or you study at university or anything like that. I've just got experience of, of of growing businesses. So I just I just try and ask people how how do you think I can help them? And if I feel like I can help them, I, I take them on as a, as, a, as a client basically. Yeah. And all I do is try and kind of share like some of the stuff that I've learned, the the the, the good things and the bad things over the last sort of decade or so to try and try and help people. So that's one of my new things that I focus on. You've built up the experience and the skill set that people are willing to pay for at the end of yeah. the day. And you know, you've got your business to where it is right now. Mm-hmm. I'm sure there's many other people that, that you know you can help as well along, along 100%. the way. And I've had some amazing clients see. to be fair. And it's it's really rewarding when people implement things that you kind of suggest and, and, and they get good results from it. So yeah. that's like a new thing for me that I'm kind of building. I'm doing it like sort of a couple of days a week. Um, but that's a new a new thing that I've got a real passion for that I'm, I'm, I'm really kind of keen on at the minute. So Talk to me about lockdown because you mentioned their lockdown, right? Yeah. And I think everyone, maybe you yourself included as well, probably thought it was going to be a week, two weeks. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So yeah. at that point there in lockdown, how many stores were you at? Um, we must have been at about maybe, maybe 14 or so. So it's a lot of... It's, we had a lot of stores. So it was, it was a really interesting time lockdown in the sense that it was obviously very depressing and, and, and a lot of stress that came with it. Now, all my local shops that I own were all shut. Uh, and originally we thought it would be like a couple of weeks and it obviously got dragged out, dragged out. So we just wanted to make sure that we were one of the people that used it to kind of uh, to grow. So we made we made like intentions, the whole company did that we were going to, you know, do as much as we could to, to grow the business. So little things like we had a whole new website done which was quite easy, but we had that done, which created, you know, a whole new online platform, which Should was really exciting. Before. We did, it just got completely re, rejigged and, like and re, it yeah, rebranded like nice and bulked up. And it was a good website before, but this, the new one was good. So little things like that. Every single night we would go online and, and you know, out of the, we've got we've got a lot of guys who work in the company, as you can imagine. So each person sort of took a night where they would go online and, and, and go live and maybe um, interview someone else in the company or they would do a haircut live and basically give back as much as they can in terms of their knowledge and, and uh, you know what they had to, to offer you know basically every night just trying to get online and, and and do something so we were we were all trying to do as much as we could to try to get the brand out there and push you know during this time of when everyone was kind of like putting their hair out stressed so for me I was doing my, my, my mentoring calls and, and, and other bits and pieces but it was also a really good time for us to speak to new people that wanted to franchise we had um, we had a couple of people who had existing barber shops they ended up changing their barber shops into a men's fire. So it was you know, I can't complain too much about lockdown although it was it was very stressful and there was times within that time when I even came here I remember just having to to lock the shop and feeling very emotional thinking like why can't I work this is just ridiculous. Mm. But we did really use it to to kind of grow the business and the brand. So we ended up coming back from lockdown with about 10 new salons uh, and a few of them were taking over existing salons. I think people uh during that time maybe felt vulnerable and in, in in a certain sense so I think by kind of like partnering up with 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 us and, and growing with us was was a was a was a good, good option. To do, yeah. And they and, and these people are do, doing really well now. They're growing with us, you know, multiple shops and things like that. So it was, in hindsight, the whole thing was very positive for us. Amongst it, it was very stressful and, and a lot of crappy moments. But yeah. we just basically wanted to, as a brand and as a business, grow, and and we managed to do that. So it was kind of like look back at it as a as a, as a positive time, and it, I think it really exp- it really exposed a lot of people through lockdown people could disappear and, and do nothing and just become a, like a lazy bum. Yeah. Or you could use that time to be do productive and do something. I think even now is when we still see the people who implemented and did things through that time. And now they're kind of like, it's kind of benefiting now. You can physically see it. 100%, and yeah. there's still a lot of people out there that, you know, I can't believe we're even talking about, I, I mentioned it, but you know, I still have people who even talk about lockdown and the reason their life is in a certain way, place is because of lockdown and stuff, which is fine. Everyone had a different experience, no, no criticism, but... I feel like if it was if you use that time to kind of invest in yourself, you're going to see the fruits of it, you know, years later, which is kind of now. Exactly. And I definitely still bump into people, and and you know, COVID is not an excuse. Obviously, people went through different things, but 
that's why their life went down down downhill and stuff. And I can only say I'm grateful that mine didn't, but I think it was it was a mindset thing at the time. Yeah, I think it depends on how you play out in lockdown as well. Definitely. You know, if you were that lazy bum and in the nicest way possible, life went to shit. Mm-hmm. And the feeling bad about it now, still still complaining about lockdown, mm-hmm. you can't really do much because that's the type mm-hmm. of person that they would have been, mm-hmm. as bad as it may sound. But it's, it's just true, exactly isn't it? That, yeah. Yeah. So I think it I think it, it exposed a lot of people in, in, in lockdown. So for us, like I'm very grateful for it. I think all that, that extra time, that spare time we had was 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 used to the, the, the best of its ability and, and, and we grew from it. So almost quite grateful for, from from lockdown. Although at the time it was a pain. Were you never scared about like the business or where it stands and the where it might potentially go or any anything that might stress you out thinking, Okay, how, where's this business gonna be once we come out of this lockdown? Yes, yeah, so there was definitely times there's definitely times when we do you remember there was a couple as well? So it was like coming back from lockdown and then hearing that it was com- getting closed down again. Yeah. Like, don't get me wrong, it really tugged at me. But I was I was very grateful that we also had salons worldwide at this time. So even when the UK was shut, we had other shops open in another part of the world. Okay, yeah, yeah. So I always just put all my kind of focus into the, whatever shop was open. There was times when not, none of them were, but there was times like the USA was open and Jordan was open or Amsterdam was open. So we kind of like, whatever was open, we kind of honed in on that. Um, and there's definitely like worries of like what's going to happen afterwards and all that kind of stuff. But again, it was a mindset thing, just kind of focused on the good things, focused on how we could use that time to grow. And uh, you know, little things like I had I had new franchises coming through, so things like cash flow and stuff. Were, it was it all kind of made sense. So I was saying, very yeah. very grateful. There was cash flow coming through at a time when there was there was no one was even making money. So I was kind of grateful that we had our our brand and our business kind of ready for, for, for people to be able to kind of like invest into it at a time like that, to be honest. Yeah. What's the product line like? So we've got an amazing hair care, hair care line that we've been using for since since day one. Um, it's amazing. We love the products. You know, we have uh, shampoos people, and People buy that online? People buy it online. All the stores obviously sell it, as you can see, all the shelves. So there's lots of it. Yeah. Um, Which we're is online. sick as well. Yeah, we're online. We're, we're worldwide. Um, we have a lot of kind of barber shops um, that wholesale it. So we do quite a lot of wholesale with it as well. Yeah. And just being really transparent, it's, a, it's part of the business that it's always done well, but it's not a part of business that we've really kind of like honed in and, and invested our time and money into it. So we're at that process now of, of really kind of like this part of the business, really kind of putting a lot of, yeah, time into I, it, I, I was going to say, because being that being essentially like e-commerce, right? Yeah. That could, I mean, obviously you would know better than me, but that could have potential to scale a lot more than it the could, actual stores it itself. It could smash all of it. And I, and I know that we've always known that it could it could do far better than and everything else that yeah. we're doing if it's done correctly, of course. Um, and no excuses, but I just feel like Josh has been very focused on what he wanted to do, which he's built and done something amazing with. I very much wanted to focus on salons and, and growing that, which I'm very grateful that they're in a good place. And it's almost just been forgotten about but the reality is if that's done well that could be doing what well, the question lost good like, things the question begs like what if you've got another person who specializes in e-commerce so this is this of? is yeah i mean without going too far into it this is what we're working on now we've we, we were in um in amsterdam just last week we had a couple of different meetings with with some people that we've just realized that we aren't experts in in that field and um yeah we do we are looking for sort of some sort of partner or sort of investor to be able to kind of give us a bit of guidance we're happy to do it by ourselves so we're kind of like now figuring out what we what needs to be done and don't get me wrong we do we do sell online we have we have good presence but we're talking about you know taking it to, to, the, to next the next level, level so yeah. we're now in it's an interesting time for us we're basically meeting various people that have got you know different ideas experiences and stuff that we're learning from um so yeah, I think by the end of this year we should be in a, a good place. And 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 to be honest, bro, inshallah, that could be the part of the business that does the best with the, the least amount of effort. To be honest, so I think it's it's, it's a new focus and it's a it's a new area that we 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 myself and Josh are ready to kind of delve into. To be honest, areas of of weakness that like for example, like you just said, yeah, like you might not have the most experience in e-commerce because mm. you're busy with many other things. Mm. Your key for that, what is it? To find someone else that that, that specialises in that, or you want to learn it all yourself? No, so for me, I've got I've got loads of weaknesses to be fair, and for my whole thing, like I said, I flopped at school, didn't do well at school academically, rubbish, awful. Even to this day, I don't really like doing too much in terms of like even emailing and all that kind of stuff. I kind of admin, I try and keep a bit hands hands off to be honest. Yeah. So I've always been um, on the lookout for people that can help me and 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 and, and assist me basically. So any weaknesses that I have. Alhamdulillah, I've got an amazing teammates and, and, and business partners that kind of basically fill those voids. So I'm very, very grateful. I've got um, a fantastic operations manager, like right-hand man called Mahi, who 
it basically handles all all the kind of the admin headache kind of stuff that I I kind of acknowledged very very early on in in, in the business as did Josh that we we didn't want to deal with all the headache of the admin everything that goes with it all the back end stuff so we we le- we learned early on that it's all about getting the right type of people to kind of come in and 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 basically fill the voids that we we're not very good at or we 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 don't want to be good at so going back to the e-commerce yeah, this is where we're now sitting down and meeting with people who have got, you know, experiences of, of doing great big things with, with product lines and stuff. So we're looking, for, we're looking for, I suppose, for a bit of guidance because we can, we can only do so much ourselves. But if someone came along who really, it was their expertise, they'd make things a lot easier. 100%. Myself and Josh even spoke the other day that we, because we, we've met a lot of people recently and it's not, none of them have been the perfect situation. Um and we basically said, look, we, we don't want to spend the next 10 years building this part of the business for then at the end of that 10 years to go, okay, that was that was good, but it was 10 years of, 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 of hard work. work. It, yeah. We want someone to fast track it. And that's what we're looking for now. We, we've, we've put the 10 years on, on, on growing what we've got here, alhamdulillah, which is great, but we want, to, we want someone to be able to fast track this that part of the business, to be honest. What made you even want to make your own products anyway? Um, so that was the, the first ever men's buyer investment that we did way before the shop even was opened that me and Josh basically both invested into a hair care range. So that's the first thing we did together as, as business partners. I think we both put a couple of grand in each. So not a huge order, but relatively big. Um, it comes down to that everyone uses hair. Most people use hair products to make a hairstyle look how it should look. You need a, a product to go with it. So they, your clients are either going to buy it from you or they're going to go down to Boots or Morrison's or whatever yeah. and buy like a an average one from a supermarket. So we, you know, Product sales is a big part of being a hairstylist. You, you generally sell a lot of products because people need them. So, you know, in terms of the, the the financial side of it, you can make a lot of money selling products. But most importantly, to, to give someone a, a look and a, and, a, and a feeling and a style, a product is, is, is essential. So if they're not going to buy it from you, they're going to go down the road and, 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 and buy else, yeah. it. So it was one of our, our first things that we did. And we basically replicated some of the products that we've been using beforehand uh, and made them made them our own basically yeah, it just makes sense then isn't it absolutely and they're brilliant and I'm, I'm i'm really really a massive fan of all of them i use them myself the beard oil is amazing shampoo conditioner the rough stuff the paste they're, they're brilliant and uh i'm fully behind them you know so i think it's just about getting them getting them out there in the market a little bit more um a few more people end users basically discovering them because they're, they're the, the best product line that I've certainly used. And obviously I would say that, but I, I firmly believe in them, you know? <laughs> well, link in the bio for that. Absolutely. Sam, I want to move on to something more personal with you then, right? Um, we're going to move on to, well, essentially people might be thinking, you know, you're, you're dropping words like inshallah, alhamdulillah, Englishman, obviously a revert. And I don't know the story either. I wanted to save it for the podcast. I love revert stories. Mm-hmm. So when did you revert? So I became a Muslim about... 10, 11 years ago now. So just before I opened the business, I opened the salon. Um, bit of a crazy story. I'll, 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 uh, I'll kind of make it... The, the full detail. The full detail. <laughs> full detail. Okay. Um, so I was very like much an, like an atheist, I suppose. I was very like, not anti-God, but definitely didn't believe in God and religion and all that kind of stuff for the majority of my life. Was that like your whole household or did you grow up in like a Christian I household? Grew up in a Christian household as such. Went to a Christian primary school. So I definitely had understanding about God and, and 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 I suppose the Christian faith and uh, about the prophets, peace be upon him. And and I, I went to church on Thursdays. It, 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 what the, the prophets? The prophets. In Christian school. In uh, no, in in Christian school. So you know about Noah. You know yeah. about Moses. You, oh yeah, you, okay, you yeah, talk yeah, about yeah. all the prophets. Yeah, of course. You yeah. talk about Prophet Muhammad yeah, 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 yeah. But you talk about the prophets. So I had an understanding who Adam and Eve was. I had an understanding. But but they're, they're not mentioned as prophets in in Christianity, are they? Uh, I think I believe that no, uh, Moses and stuff would be would be prophets. I'm, I'm not too sure. To be yeah, 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 yeah. Because yeah. they're all people. They're all they're all basically messages that messengers that came with with the same message. Yeah. So my my point is, I, I kind of knew about the story of 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 God and and messengers and all that kind of stuff. Um, but then that's primary school, left primary school, and it just wasn't on my mind for for a very long time. Like I said, not anti it, but definitely not like aware of it, not spiritual, didn't really understand it. It wasn't something I was ever really looking for. Um, and I suppose like a long story short, I found myself um, in uh, not the best of places, although everything was going amazing for me, definitely missing something, clearly had a, a kind of a void inside me. I was doing quite well like financially, I had lots of things going on for me, it was great, but definitely kind of felt like something was missing. How old is this now? Maybe 22, 22 times, so going out a lot, spending a lot of time in Ibiza, a lot of time in festivals, like lots of raving, lots of kind of like all that kind of stuff. 
um, and, and, and kind of been co in it and enjoying it, but then really feeling like crap the rest of the week not, and feeling a bit kind of depressed, I suppose. Not like I was depressed, but had a great weekend. Then I felt like crap and was a bit lost. Yeah. Uh, and along the journey, I started having some really like wild experiences with like um, with out of body experiences and, and, and gin and things like that. Oh, really? Yeah. So I. Um, or like just randomly, or did you go somewhere that triggered it? So I had basically just started experiencing these um, out of body experiences like quite often, and basically like almost like discovered that I could do these out of body experiences like with, with DMT and things like that, um, where I would you know leave my body, and uh, basically like these beings would come and speak to me. And I remember going and speaking to my mate at the time, who was Muslim. I said, "Oh, bro." I keep on having these out body experiences, they're mental, blah, blah, blah. I keep on meeting these kind of like these these things. And he was like, oh, they're called gin. I was like, what's that? What's gin? Are you, the drink gin. He's like, no, nah, no, nah, gin is... is <laughs> the drink gin. The drink. That's what I said. I was like, what, the drink? He said, nah, gin basically means uh, unseen in Arabic. And that just spun my head and I started basically exploring what this could possibly be because basically like having like very very intense dreams and having well they like nightmares or just like no they were, they were real life so basically i don't know if you much know much about dmt and like out of body experiences like there's so like i'm not not to promote it or anything like that but obviously jahilia getting involved with all this kind of stuff which kind of basically is like borderline black black magic really so it's basically you leave your you leave your bot your your soul or whatever leaves your body and you basically experience like um, an experience that isn't really the same as this, is, but you're, you're still kind of awake. Yeah, yeah, I get what you're saying. It's, um, you ever seen that film Insidious? Yes. Horror film. Yeah. Like that. Kind Just of. like that. Yeah. Well, all those horror films, are all they all talk about another dimension of stuff because it's, it's real stuff. Yeah, 100%. Yeah. real stuff. So I went, without going too into that part of it, there's, there was a lot of that and like a lot of like soul searching and basically from all this kind of stuff, like discovering that there was, I had a soul, I had a spirit, spirituality, what gin was, what black learning what black magic was learning what like freemasonry was learning about illuminati learning like all this crazy stuff you went literally down the whole went down the whole eight months or so i was disappeared oh, down seriously? the whole yeah because i needed to like i basically had all these ex- mad experiences basically as, as you're researching this is are these like out of body experiences still happening i still was continued doing it for for a while yeah because they're like without going into it too much it's kind of like it was a big eye opener that there was there was more going on than than what i knew as 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 previous so um yeah, like soul searching, like finding out a bit more about spirituality, like definitely becoming more spiritual, more aware of like energy, more aware about everything really. Kind of like going like kind of into a bit of a weirdo, to be honest. Um, and I was like looking into like Buddhism, I was looking into everything and um, just trying to like figure it all out. I just knew there was something to figure out. I wasn't sure what it was. So um, at first I was just like a spiritual like hippie and happy and it was all cool. Then I kind of look, looked at Buddhism and, and Rastafari and, and all these different kind of various religions. Um, and then I had a, a, a friend the whole time that basically was sending me different videos and this, that and the other about Islam. Is this the same friend that... Same friend yeah. at the very beginning who basically told me what jinn was. Yeah. He wasn't particularly practicing at the time, but he had... Knowledge of it. Knowledge, so he would kind of feed me what I needed to know. And um, yeah, long story short, I was watching a documentary at his house one evening and there was a certain line that was said in, in the documentary about your Lord, Prophet Muhammad would say something about your Lord has not got one eye. And all, I was been, all I'd been researching and stuff was like Illuminati, this one eye stuff, one eye is everywhere. Um, and it basically, just, it just dawned on me that evening after kind of like researching stuff that Islam, although I didn't want it to be like the most obvious truth, it kind of hit me as, as the only kind of, of the only obvious truth that only, only religion the only thing that kind of many any any kind of sense to me with you know with proof and records and and uh you know i suppose evidence to suggest that it's real so that evening i basically realized that islam was going to be the truth and uh although i didn't really plan on it or want to be muslim i, I knew i was going to have to kind of be muslim and that was the start of of changing my life really some going from one extreme to the other um what but, was it about that one quote that made you open your eyes to islam though I'm just, so, I'm just trying to understand that. So the quote was about your, your, I've got one eye tattoo up here. Yeah. And I was at the time researching a lot about like devil worship and what the one eye means and the one eye, and you know, the jaw. Mm-hmm. That, that, yeah, know, yeah, yeah. And all this kind of stuff. So that was one of my, one of my main focus points. And at the other, at the other time, at the same time, sorry, the guy that was helping me and telling me bits and pieces about Islam, he had a friend of his that was doing black magic stuff. Oh, is it? Okay. Yeah. So, 
at the same time with me, like having my experiences and, and learning ab about all this spirituality, I had this guy that was doing black magic stuff and he was going to Madagascar and it, to the islands of Madagascar and was doing like different rituals and killing chickens and just doing all this mad stuff. And then he was coming back here, had voodoo dolls, all this crazy stuff. At the time, it just blew my mind. I didn't really understand it all, but that was happening at the same time of, of my discovery. So it was almost like backing up the kind of stuff that I was researching. I was like, wow, this guy's actually, I watched a video of him like killing a chicken like and all this kind of crazy stuff that made no real sense to me so it was all happening at the right time to kind of provide more and more proof and evidence that this stuff is actually real so to answer your question why did that quote hit me Allah knows best but that's the quote that afterwards I realized that Islam was the truth because at this point I kind of understood who the prophets were I understood who Moses, Noah, peace be upon them all, uh, Isa, Jesus, Muhammad, Sallallahu all of all of this I kind of I, just, I saw it for what it was and realized that this is the only religion that's been untouched, that has got lots of evidence, the Quran hasn't been touched, all this kind of stuff. And just the one quote that he said about your Lord has not got one eye. I don't know why that was the thing that, that hit me, but I think it's probably because all like the, the devil worship stuff that I'd kind of like discovered, I think that was the thing that just kind of locked it in for me. And, yeah. I, and, and literally after I heard that, I paused it, went outside uh, and looked up at the trees and just life was literally like a different thing to me after, after that evening, bro. Um, and I, I believed in God. I'm, I'm interested to know, how did you compare Islam to, you know, you grew up in, in a Christian primary school, right? Mm -hmm. So how did you com like compare it to that? Um, very different, man. Very, very different. I just... Um, if you could remember your primary school, of course. Of course. So it's just very different. Like you could definitely see like the similarities, but it's like Islam and Muslims just took it very, very seriously. But I had probably quite bad experiences at school with some of the Muslim guys that I went to school with that kind of made the religion look like quite aggressive. I remember just like seeing videos of like people getting beheaded and all this crazy stuff. Okay, I remember yeah, like yeah. I remember seeing the guys, Muslim guys, laughing at it. And I remember thinking, wow, that's so such a strange thing to laugh at. I remember thinking very like it was very evil. I didn't really understand it at the time, but I remember thinking Muslims were a bit like anti crazy. Yeah, crazy and, and, and anti us like white folk. And when 9-11 happened, I was like, couldn't get my head around it. And then I, I, I probably, I just had, uh, you know, the bad, the bad in, interpretation of what Islam was. So then having to like accept it to be the truth. I remember just thinking at the time, all I know, the only Muslims I know are really like older Asian guys that were like the, the thobes walking up and down. I didn't really know anyone on the level that was practicing Muslim. But as soon as you start looking into it and you look at the similarities between that and and Christianity and, and Judaism and you you realise that it's kind of originally was all the same thing but this one's like the stricter version with nothing taken out like yeah, basically nothing changed. man hasn't got involved and made it easier and more simple Yeah, because there was points of me when I was before I re reverted that I was like maybe Christianity is the right thing because this 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 and I had people telling me that it's the right thing and I'm looking at it thinking yeah maybe it is maybe it's just I go to church on a Sunday and all this kind of stuff and maybe my life doesn't have to change that much but then the more you look into it the more kind of like the facts are kind of there, you know, um, when you look at it with an open heart and you, you kind of add it all up, just little things like how Jesus used to pray and, and yeah, all this kind of stuff. I was literally just thinking of this right now in yeah. my head. That, that's the main thing for me. Like, yeah. if Jesus... Didn't, didn't this, they discover this in an old Bible or something that came up recently where it said, there like, was a quote in the Bible that said the way that Jesus prayed was bestowing his head on the floor. Yeah, that's, that's what I'm saying. He puts his head on the floor. He pray, That's how he prays to God. Yeah. So basically Jesus, and then if you think about little things like Jesus had a beard and how he looked, he looked like a Muslim. Yeah. And how he spoke was, he was spoke about the Lord, the Father. Well, essentially was, Arab man, yeah, isn't it? Yeah, exactly that. So the whole thing, even what he came with was about Tawheed and oneness and monotheism about God. It was all about one God. And, you know, he said not to eat, not to eat, uh, swine, not to eat pig, all this. Well, basically, like the Muslims basically took everything very, very seriously, and I could see it straight away. And, and I didn't really want to accept that I have to do five prayers a day and all this kind of stuff. That seemed like way too much for me. But there was just no denying it. I was thinking, there's just too much evidence suggests this is the original, this is the way that God, our Creator, wants us to live. And uh, I can see how in the past that, you know, man has got involved and shaitan's got involved and corrupted it and make, made it made it what it is now. But Islam was just, it was just clear cut, like, there's no denying this thing. Although I wanted to try and find every evidence suggests that I didn't have to become a Muslim and tell my mum and dad that I'm going to be a Muslim and all this kind of stuff. At the time, it was like, no, there must be another option. But this this is so interesting because, like you, like you, it's almost like you discovered in that, in that split moment mm -hmm. that Islam is the truth, mm -hmm. right? 
but at the same time, it's almost like your mind was in denial about it. That's yeah. what I'm, I'm kind of hearing from it, right? Definitely. Try so, to look for any, every option to kind of figure out there must be something so else to- Didn't that like mind bamboozle you thinking, what am I, what, what do I do? Like, where do I stand? Yeah, so uh, fortunately I had some good brothers around me. So, and very much like Shaitan is, is, a, is, a real, is a real force. Yeah. So it was like, I knew it was the truth. And then I had some like Christian people giving me some like dawa and telling me about bad things about the religion, and, th- and it was conflicting and confusing. But I remember just like going back to the original feelings of that evening when I kind of realised that it, it was the truth, and and I remember just thinking, I just need to take my shahada. Everything, I'm easy. So again, even the day of the shahada, trying to make excuses why I couldn't go to the masjid, and like a million, a million excuses to avoid it, because you know it's, it's a big, it's a big commitment, and especially like living my life how I was living it, and then suddenly having to deal with this stuff. It was just like. This is a big change. I know it's the truth. But I don't know if I want to do this change, but I know it is the truth, and I know that I've been shown it's the truth. So I don't want to mess around with it too much. Yeah. How soon after was it from from that point? Weeks, I suppose. Oh, is it okay? Weeks, couple of weeks. Yeah. Two weeks, maybe. That's Just not, figuring it out. Yeah. That's not, not too long. Yeah. Not too I knew long. I didn't enough. want to mess around. I didn't want to mess around because from all of my out body experiences, everything. And this is like a year or so now of of, of really like trying to like figure out what's going on. I just knew what I discovered was too precious to mess around with. So I just like, although I didn't want it to be the truth, I knew it was. So just embraced it. And then, you know, just dealt with everything else along the way, to be honest. Um, and the point of where you actually took your shahada, how did you feel? Uh, amazing. And the guy that took my shahada was someone that I used to go to school with like years back that we, we didn't get on with very well at all. Oh, is it? Not at all. And it was just bizarre. He was the one who took my shahada and then we embraced and like, it was just, yeah, like life changing, bro, to be honest. That's... Um, obviously a while ago now, but like life just, I just st- I started taking life a lot more seriously and not in a, not in a boring way, but just like start taking, really understanding what life was all about. So it was in- incredible to, to become Muslim. And then life just changed dramatically kind of afterwards. Naturally yeah. things like drop off out of your life. You change the things you do. So I remember I went to, I was invited to go to Umrah, like the Come first few months of being a Muslim. Oh, is it? So my mum oh. and dad were like... You hit the jackpot. Alhamdulillah. So <laughs> I went to Al-Aqsa in Palestine. So we did our Umrah from Palestine to, to, to Saudi. So yeah. at the time, bro, like I didn't really know that much of what was going on. So I definitely appreciated it. But I was like, surreal. That's I'm such a beautiful thing though. Yeah. Alhamdulillah, I had some good brothers that invited me. So I, w- I was able to like really embrace it and get involved a lot early on. What was it like seeing the Kaaba for the first time? Yeah, amazing, but I can't lie, bro. I was with a lot of brothers that were crying their eyes out and I didn't understand it so much. Yeah, because yeah, I'm yeah. Like, I, bro, I haven't grown you up. You haven't seen that? I haven't yeah, grown yeah. up with this thing in my picture of it in my kitchen. Yeah, yeah, or yeah, like yeah. Those of like people's fat, like, fat That's households. exactly how it was in my household. Like I've only ever seen this on TV, on pictures, on the wall. Of course. And yeah, so that's And then you see it. So bro, it was obviously incredible and emotional and, and like I could feel like how amazing it was. But I didn't even really know what the Kaaba was. I was like, it wasn't too, it wasn't too premature to go, but I had to learn a lot about kind well, of- Allah invited you at the end of the day. Exactly that. For a reason. But it wasn't like, I remember thinking, why am I not as, as emotional looking at this, this big black box? Like, well, tell me about this big black box. Like, why, like, a few months ago, I'm in a rave. Now I'm suddenly in Saudi Arabia. Um, so it was amazing. And um, I definitely have, have appreciated it more so over the years. I've been able to return being like some, with a bit more knowledge of, of, of everything to do with obviously Saudi and stuff. But what, what a way to enter the religion three months in going to, firstly going to Palestine and then that, that whole experience which was, was amazing. But then also doing Umrah. Um, I'm just very grateful that I started with, with, a, with a bang to be honest and got like stuck in quite early. You know? oh, alhamdulillah. How did you manage to, you know, because obviously be, being in a lifestyle before, like you said, you're going raves and all that sort of stuff. How did you manage to like kind of switch it if you did? Was it a slow transition or? Straight away, just dropped it all. Straight away, yeah. I had to drop it all, yeah. Um, I had kind of I had enough of it at that point. To be honest, like, I spent years of like going out and like raving, and, and it just like it, it takes its toll on you. I was almost just looking for an excuse to like to stop it anyway, you know, like a real valid reason. Because I'm talking about you go out on Friday, you come back on Sunday, and you and you feel like crap for the whole week. It's, yeah, it's, yeah, yeah. It's, 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 it's an investment. Your whole life is spent like trying to like just recover, from recover, the weekend. basically. Yeah, and it stays with you, you know. Yeah. So I was quite, almost like grateful that I'd kind of found something that. It was strong enough for me to just to drop it all and just and and stop it. So I remember like I remember the last thing I went to, and the last the last event I went to, I was actually I before I became Muslim, but I knew that Islam was the truth at this point. So I was like giving dawah to loads of people at like Eastern Electrics, like a festival up in uh, 
I can't remember where it was now, but I remember talking to people about the religion there and people thinking, this guy's lost his head. Yeah, what is this um, guy on? <laughs> and that was the last time I went out. That was literally, what was this guy on? Yeah. And I was literally, but like, I'm talking to people in that environment about Islam and stuff. And they were like, you, Sam, slow down. Like, are you okay? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was like, I'm good, yeah. But um, so that was the last time. And then, uh, and then just dropped it. And uh, like I said, kind of like happy that I found something that I could drop it for. Um, because I spent years, I invested years of, of, of my life kind of going out and stuff. And you don't really get that much from it. Do you know what I'm saying? You have a good time when you're, when you're caught up in the, in the moment. But really and truly, it's, it's, a, it's a waste of time from my, my perspective anyway. So yeah, that all got dropped. And then just kind of like quickly just grew up, I suppose. And then became a business owner. And then I moved out. I got married. Started having children. Started building my business. So like, just like went from, I'm still young, but I went from like a, a young boy just living like a, a a nice life, but not really doing that much. Then suddenly, just taking things quite seriously, and 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 all the like, all the serious stuff in life became the priority, and 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 not going out and and not wasting all my time socially. I like put that into, I suppose, growing my family and growing my business. So that's honestly a beautiful thing, man. Yeah, alhamdulillah. alhamdulillah. And, 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 and fortunately, like Josh, Josh became Muslim at oh, is it? the same time as me. Yeah, no way. Okay. So he was he was Christian. He was Catholic or whatever. Yeah. Um, not that he particularly followed the faith, but he had a understanding of God and stuff. So. When I started t- talking to him about Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, and showing him, giving him different like leaflets, and 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 basically saying, "Look, bro, this is this is." Is this when you was a Muslim now? I I become Muslim at this point, and I was just basically just getting onto him, getting onto him because I knew that he believed in God, and I yeah. thought I can just this yeah. guy is smart. I know I, if I can show him the right thing, yeah. and alhamdulillah, he he became Muslim as well. So it just it made things easier when when we set up this the business. It means that before the f- the first shop opened, like we were totally in in line with everything. Like yeah, yeah. Islam was like the thing telling us what we can and can't do. So we changed a few things. I think crazy. We were going to have the opening, like, you know, like a big DJ opening and, and alcohol and all that kind of stuff. So when all Islam came in, all that stuff just got dropped out and it's not like we ever missed it, but we, we, we changed a few things, but um, it was perfect timing. It was divine timing. And it was we basically both started our business and became Muslims at the same time. So we went through all the kind of same challenges, I suppose, at the same time, like even with like with our families and everything, and we and and and, uh, and also from he had he was on the same sort of things. Me, he wouldn't go out, he wouldn't drink or anything like that, but he would go out a lot socially. Mm. So we both went from being out and about all the time, so then not being out and about, and always kind of working, and and then suddenly being these Muslim guys. And I think it took a little bit of time for people to kind of get their heads around it, but um, it was the best thing that we ever did, to be honest. When did you tell your family, and how did they take it? Um, I told them like pretty soon after I became Muslim, to be fair. Because I was giving my mum like the commentary like when I was like becoming spiritual and stuff and I was like trying to tell her about like energy and God and stuff. And then she was all for it because she'd kind of see me going from like a bit more of like a, not the dark side, but a lo- bit lost and lots of whatever else, you know, going out and all this kind of stuff. To then suddenly talking about like God and energy and nice things. And so I think she was very supportive then. Then the Islam stuff came out and she, they were quite worried. Um, and especially like when we went to Saudi Arabia, they, uh, I think my mum thought I was going to Syria or something at the time. Oh, it? it was at the same time when there was a lot of stuff going on in, in, in the in media. The world, yeah. And there was a lot of like, it was the anti-Islam stuff was, was going crazy. So I, I embraced it at the time of like when there was pure hate for Islam. So uh, do you know what? It was, it was the case of people used to keep telling me like it's about dawah in actions. So basically when you are a good Muslim and you just do everything that you, you, you should do as a Muslim, people will see that and they'll, they'll, they'll respect it and they'll rate it. And you know, you can't really knock someone who's practicing their religion properly because you should be like a really good person and, and looking after your neighbor and being polite and smiley and all the rest of it. So my focus was not to try and talk to them about the religion that much, but just implement it and let them see me and how it will change my life for the best. And I, I would say they probably have seen that. Um, so at first it was very rocky and 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 we was not speaking for Josh so, so much but it was very rocky for him he, you know our mums would 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 talking to each other and that kind of stuff people people were worried everyone was worried people were worried bro people were worried we would come in the shop and at the beginning we we spoke about it a lot probably too much so we we've gone from one side to the other now we're just talking about god and islam and prophet muhammad peace be upon him so people were worried worried and thought we'd gone a bit it's overboard a bit but then it kind of then it kind of balanced out and we kind of i suppose applied some wisdom along the way yeah uh, and now we're still you know out you know, common out and out muslims as such but we don't need to preach about it in people's ears if someone asks me about it i've got all the time in the world to talk about it but yeah. at the beginning we were very excited trying to probably like talk to everyone about it and get everyone to revert and all this kind of stuff <laughs> as you're cutting the hair literally, you should become muslim bro 100 <laughs> yeah. percent. we literally did too much but um we were excited. We thought we'd, we'd, we'd just discovered this thing that was obviously life-changing. We wanted everyone to kind of ex- see it, but yeah. obviously it's not as simple as that. So it was it was quite turbulent at the time, 
but then people can't knock like when we just start doing our thing you, you can't knock it and and uh, I think you know alhamdulillah a lot of people who've come to work for us have, have become Muslim and still Muslim now which is, which is amazing I work with a lot of reverts who just came back from Saudi like 10 of us were out in, in, in Saudi Arabia all men spy which was amazing so we have we have alhamdulillah a lot of Muslims we have a lot of non-Muslims uh, which is absolutely cool but um, I think we just focus on doing our, our thing the best we can and then hopefully people kind of see it and, it and it's like I said, dour in actions. People can see the good that we're doing and it has some sort of influence in a positive way. Well, dawah in actions, that brings on to me to my, pretty much my final point. Mm -hmm. Char charitable work. Mm -hmm. So the point when you're Muslim, obviously, I know you, you mentioned that you do charitable work, which I want to dive into in a second, but mm -hmm. was, that, was it part of your life before? Not at all. No? no, not at all. No, I was in doing charity. Yeah. Like, no, not at all, bro, to be honest. Uh, not that I was anti-charity, but I would never... Actively do it. Nah, not really, bro, to be honest. I don't think I was ever really given the opportunity. I feel like when I became a Muslim, and I feel like when you... When you want to do good, good opportunities get presented to you. Um, so I never really had the opportunity put in front of me. But then this, the same guy that invited me to go to, to Umrah um, so early on in, into my being a Muslim, then invited me to go to, to go to India, where he was from, to do some charity work there. So the first thing that we did is we, we raised a load of money um, in this room in the other shop, raised loads of money, and we went off to India and, and we did like an orphanage over there. So that was our first thing. Um, and it just became like a bit of like a... An addiction getting involved with, with doing little projects and, and, and hearing about not a financial gain from it but hearing about you know students becoming hafis and stuff from what you've yeah. in, invested in it was a very very rewarding feeling really so um, not to go into it too much or anything like that but we've, we've tried to kind of use our influence and platform to do bits and pieces around the world with orphanages and things like that in India and Africa and stuff like that so um, I think it's just about using our platform and, 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 and the reach that we've got to try and do as much as we can really and just trying to invest in the hereafter a little bit Alhamdulillah I mean I have a friend uh, she went to Lebanon when she got in December I think um, yeah. obviously circumstances there are crazy and you know she's given back constantly and she literally said when she came back the heart, her heart is still in Lebanon Wow. and the way she changes and the way she's so grateful for everything she is now which is amazing 100% I said to her yeah cool I'm gonna go with, I said yeah I'll, I'm gonna go to Lebanon this year as well if you go yeah um, and then, do you know what, funny enough, in Ramadan, um, I went to Turkey. I saw you went to Turkey, yeah. Yeah, I yeah. went to Turkey with a few boys. I was like, there was like 30 of us, I want to yeah, say. Yeah, nice. Literally just went to the earthquake sites. Of course, yeah. Yeah, delivering food, shelter, sure, anything we could. And it actually felt like proper, proper good, man. Like, yeah, it's the best it was, feeling in the world, isn't it? When yeah. You can, when, you can do, when you can help someone else and uh, and have a good intention behind it, it's like the best feeling ever. Bro, that, that month from, like I was saying, I was telling you, I went Umrah in uh, mm -hmm. March, yeah? So mm -hmm. I come back from March. Uh, I come back from Umrah in March. Two days later, was Ramadan. So then you're still in the Islamic spirit. Because mm -hmm. sometimes you can come back from Umrah and you can... Definitely. Yeah. Definitely. But then because there was still, still a spirit, spirit around from yeah. Ramadan. Yeah. And then in Ramadan, got invited to the opportunity to go to Turkey, literally on like three days notice. Mm -hmm. So we're like, yeah, cool. Mm -hmm. And then the whole charitable act, that, that's why I literally say that, you know, I might not have made the most amount of money between March and April. Mm hmm but that was the wealthiest month I've ever had with my life. Subhanallah. So that's crazy, man. Crazy how our life can take things. Subhanallah. Yeah, that's amazing. Subhanallah. So would you say that's changed your mindset a little bit towards? Yeah, definitely, man. Definitely. Like, I definitely want to give back a lot more. Yeah. Uh, I want to try, you know, do as much as I can physically to help more people. Um, yeah, man. I think things changed, like I said, from, from a bit more money hungry before to now I'm just like, yeah, cool, it is what it is. Of course. You know, life will happen inshallah we've got to look, we'll look at the Akira definitely <laughs> I want to end up in Jannah bro of course of course <laughs> you know what I'm saying I think you especially feel that when you're in Saudi though man you, you're you in you're in Mecca and you're in Medina and like all the dunya stuff that you're, you care so much about is yeah, the most irrelevant thing care, ever. Yeah, ever and you yeah. look around and you see all these people making a huge effort to like worship their lord and you literally feel like why am I wasting my time even building anything in dunya yeah, like, yeah, I'm, yeah. I'm heading in this direction the reason I'm here and the reason I'm praying literally. is because Time's I know where I'm going past, so, I know yeah and, and it's, it's annoying and, and, and alhamdulillah similar to me I went to had Ramadan then we had a couple of weeks in between then went to Umrah so that whole kind of period of time was very very beautiful nice like nice like spiritual feeling like you're, like you're saying yeah and now I'm back from Saudi and stuff I can just feel that kind of the, the dunya kind of creeping in as, as normal but I'm just trying to hold on to that mindset of just when I was out there and just when you feel actually what, what is important and, and, and what's actually worth putting effort into and, and focus but it's uh it's good for the mindset, man. It clears you out and it kind of reminds you of uh, what's really important in life, you know? 100%. Sam, uh, if there's any final message that you want to end on for the audience to take note of, what would you say to them? Um, any final messages? 
Um, have a good, clean intention. Work really hard. Focus on what's important. Uh, and make sure that you're working alongside people that you like and make you feel good. And just enjoy it. If you're not enjoying it, there's no point doing it. Yeah. And if people want to find you on socials, where can they do so? So you'd find me on Men's Bar Salon uh, or S Empire. Uh, you'll find me there, inshallah. Inshallah. That's Instagram, yeah? Instagram, sorry, yeah. Yeah, lovely. Um, if you want to follow us, make sure you subscribe to CEO Cast. We want to see no less than 10,000 likes on this episode. Um, what else? If you listen to this, make sure you leave a review. And until then, I'll catch you on the next episode of CEO Cast. Peace. Sam, good, lovely. Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah, amazing. Thank you, bro. Thank you for coming on, bro. Thank you so much. Honestly, thank you.